is the Stargirl After Show with Sarah and Sean. Your post-show breakdown of DC Stargirl with Easter eggs, exclusive behind-the-scenes info, and cast and crew interviews. This is our destiny. I finally know who I really am. I'm Stargirl. This is the Stargirl Star After Show. Hey, Star Fam! Welcome back to Star Girl After Show, sponsored as it has been since the beginning by Star Girl TV and DCTV.News, your best resources for news, media, and spoilers about Star Girl and other DC Comics properties. I'm Sean, and I'm Sarah. And this week, we find out who the killer is, because that's the title: The Killer, written by James Robinson. And Taylor Streets, James teaming up with somebody for an episode, unexpectedly. And directed by Andy Armaganian, one of our favorite Stargirl directors. I had so many emotions right off the bat with this episode. I was a roller coaster. Look, let's jump to the, to the end like we did last week. And just say, did you have the Return of Icicle on your bingo card? I did not. I don't think I've seen anyone in all of the theories I've read online. I don't think I've seen anyone predict that. I don't think I have either. And I'm a little bit surprised. I feel like early on, I was like, oh, well, Icicle, we didn't see the body because, you know, he was shattered in the ice pieces. We definitely talked about that in season one. Yeah. How ice pieces, anything can happen. Yeah. And then season two, like he, there was a Calypso icicle and so i guess that kind of just satisfied my thought that he might come back yeah i had no idea but i was also just furious with him at the end of this episode not ready to talk about that part yet i gotta say when i uh read the script i like just stood up i was i stood up i was like oh my god just from reading the script i can't imagine what it must have been like to discover it for the first time like watching it and how incredible that it was kept a secret. Oh, yeah. The fact that no one saw Neil Jackson around, that no one spoiled it on set. Like, that's incredible. I, I think someone, a vet or somebody, uh, posted a photo to Instagram where um, they had all gone to an escape room. Mm-hmm. And they had that photo at the end and Neil Jackson was there. Oh, really? Yeah. Did she take that down right away? No, I think they just were like, there's there's nothing about this that says Icicle comes back. Neil Jackson's yeah. an actor. They shoot a lot of stuff in Atlanta. He could be That's around. True. There could be a flashback. Any number of things. I guess it would look more suspicious if she did delete it. Yeah. Because you know people already saw it. Oh, yeah. When something gets posted on, on the internet mm-hmm. and then immediately taken down, mm-hmm. people are like, ah, Remember, I said that thing meant that this and now it's gone. So obviously it definitely does mean that. So, yeah, let's jump into the episode so we can hurry up and talk about Icicle. All right. So we are at the crack house and I'm on top of the world is playing. I'm, I'm sorry. It sounded like you said crack house. I may have accidentally said that <laughs> because that's what I said in my head when I read this. So we open up at the crack house. We got I'm on top of the world playing and it's such a normal, happy home. I already was starting to feel anxious because if the Crocs are having such a good time and fitting in and being the life that they have been trying to make, I did not feel very uh, confident for their future here. Yeah, you you always got to be nervous when when someone is having it too good. Mm-hmm. And I mean, by the time in the end where he says everything's coming up Croc today, you're like, oh, no. Yeah. Well, at the beginning, I think the first sign was Paula was wearing a shirt that says, I need coffee. And I was like, oh, no, that was the start of her friendship with Barb was when they, she finally had coffee with her. Um. So, yeah, I mean, they've they've integrated really well. They seem to have just like this idyllic small town life and there's not a sign of fakery it it's no. just straight up this is their lives now they are reformed courtney has put her trust into the right people and it's paid off it really has we see them stop in front of the the mock house and 
they're talking about Pat and Barbara are people saying we can't just let grandma and grandpa icicle walk away from this, but they don't know what to do because they're like, we aren't going to use violence anymore. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's a real tell because they're talking to each other. It's not performative. Mm -hmm. It's just the two of them. Yeah. So there's no reason for this not to be true from a narrative standpoint. Yes. And, you know, if a show did do that, had two people having a conversation like that and it was fake, that's real cheap. It is. That's the kind of cheap Stargirl doesn't do. Then we go and we got a flash of pink in the trees and Jakeem and Mike are trying to find their way home. But instead of being at home or having cell phone service, they instead have a phone booth that popped up in the middle there. So this is the scene that like made me feel old. (laughs) Also in reading the script, because when Mike says it sounds like a UFO, I thought two things. I thought, oh, my God, when was the last time I heard a dial tone? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, my God, there are entire generations of people who have never heard a dial tone. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, my God. And so they didn't get to make a call because they didn't have a dime. And if they had a dime, by the way, I love Jakeem's line. Why would I need to carry around a dime? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But if they had a dime... I don't know that they would have been able to make a call anyway, because that was a rotary phone. Well, that and I don't know that they would have any numbers memorized because they're all programmed into cell phones now. That's a good point. Also, how about that? uh, Home is where the heart is. Crack from the Thunderbolt. Oh, that was hilarious. And then we get some roaring going on or growling or some kind of scary noises and they start running. And then we go over to the Whitmore Dugan kitchen where Courtney, Pat, Barbara, Yolanda, and Sylvester are all trying to figure out what's going on with Mike and Jakeem. No one can get a hold of them. And Pat is really worried that he might be with Grandma and Grandpa Icicle. But Sylvester points out that the boys lied about where they were before all that happened. And so it's completely unrelated, which I think is very good. That should give Pat some comfort, but... Of course, he's still going to be super worried. And, you know, he's going to be thorough. Yeah. He's going to go check there anyway in a few scenes here. But first, we've got Sophus in the hospital after his heart attack. Mm -hmm. I noticed that, A, Lily is obviously pushing Cam to murder. Of course. Like, go get Courtney. You'll know what must happen next. Classic Lily. Oh, grandma. Oh, he's trying to get me to murder my girlfriends. But Camp does stick up and he says he might have died if Beth hadn't called 911. Yeah. But like, bro, Beth also straight up defibrillated him. Why are, why are we not calling that out? She did more than call 911. Did he specifically say call 911? Yeah. Oh, uh, OK. I just wrote in my notes that he would have died without Beth Chapel. Yeah. He said if she hadn't called 911, which okay. I, I don't know. That's a weird line because... Anyone would have called 911. Right. And what Beth did was far more heroic and life-saving. Yeah. So it's weird that he said it that way. Or maybe he's, I don't know, maybe he doesn't know all that happened. That could be. I mean, he was, he had a pretty big surprise and shock and everything. So I would expect him not to have processed everything yet. But when Lily tells him, you know what must be done next, he replies and says, I know. But he doesn't say what he knows. So I don't think he's going to go kill Courtney. I don't know. Like, maybe she gave him the McKent family PowerPoint. Maybe. It's like, then someone crosses you, you'll freeze their insides and shatters them into dust. Or you shoot an icicle right into his heart like she did with Mr. Dysinger. Yeah. Which, not as effective... Like, there's still a body to get rid of. Yeah. I I really think that Jordan is just the strongest of the family. Uh, Based on what we saw in this episode, I think so. I liked when Cameron went and looked at the mural that he painted of his dad. A nice callback to season two, because that's pretty much where he was all season there. Yeah. Didn't have a super ton going on. Just uh, failing to kiss Courtney and painting Mm -hmm. a mural. Yeah. And then we go over and Beth's mom is looking over Rick. He's kind of trying to make jokes and she's like, your heart is an unnatural level right now. 
Beth tries to say it's the hourglass to Rick and he's snapping at her. And I do not like anyone snapping at Beth. No, that uh, do not tell me what to do was uh, chilling, honestly. It was. And I was really proud of Beth because it's hard to stand up to your friends, especially when you know that they're all hopped up on the hourglass. But she and her parents are trying to hold a little intervention for him. I got to be honest, thinking the word hour night while watching that scene made me very uncomfortable. Yeah. But yeah, they, they bring up all the worries about the hourglass that seem very warranted. And, you know, we should mention that the reason he told her not to tell him what to do is because she suggested he take the hourglass off for just 10 minutes and see how he feels. Yeah, he is clearly not in his right mind. But that's all we get of him this episode, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, then we are going over to Pat and Sylvester pulling up to the Mockhead house. And uh, Sylvester is really doubting the decision not to bring the staff. But Pat's like, we're not here to fight. I love his cheerful, like, we're going to die. That was such a funny line. But Pat did, just wants to find Mike and make peace. So Sophus in this scene really seems like like he's kind of resigned to the fact that now there's no changing Lily's mind. There's no getting yeah. through to her We're to the point where he's not even like trying for peace anymore. He says, y'all need to run away or come at us. Mm -hmm. He like straight up come at me, bros them. And so when they first go and sit down, this is the first time Sophus has sat on the opposite side so I was trying to figure out like if there's any symbolism there that he's kind of trying to move on. I don't know. Usually Lily is where Sylvester is sitting and then Sophus was sitting where Pat was sitting, which also kind of matches with the hot temper and the more easygoing one. I don't know. Maybe they usually give the, the comfier seats to guests, but given that he's just gotten out of the hospital, he's taking the comfy seat. That could be too. I didn't even notice that. They do that later with the Crocs too. I would not put it past Andy to have some great reasoning for that. I just don't know what it is. I can't help you. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, Pat asks Sophus about Mike and Joachim, and Sophus is saying, if I felt any better, I would be angry with you for accusing me of hurting kids. And I'm like, what did you just do last episode? Hey, Joey's Eric. That wasn't him, but it was his son. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I did like Sylvester the little line calling him Grandpa Frostbite. Yes. That's just a funny line. Oh, I want to call out another thing. When he's like, you murdered our son. And then Sylvester tries to get a fist bump from Pat. Is that what he was trying to do? Yeah, he like put his fist over and like put it to Pat's hand. And Pat was like, what are you doing? And then okay. I was like, what are you doing? I was trying to figure out what he was doing as well, but I didn't put it together that that's what it was. I think he was trying to give Pat props because remember, yeah. Icicle killed him. Oh, yeah. So he's like, all right, you avenged me. Thanks, bud. Dap. Yeah. Nobody calls it Dap anymore, but you know, he's been dead for 10 years. So I mean, he's still using MapQuest. Yeah. And Sofa sends him away before his wife returns and kills them. So back at home, Barb is. She's made a list and it's all the people that she can contact that might know where Mike and Jakeem are and she's crossing off the list. But then there's a knock on her door and it's Lily. Unexpected Lily. And I thought for sure this was the moment Barbara's going to die. But no. Barbara's not happy enough in this moment to die. It's true. Like everything needs to be on top of the world for her if she's going to die. So, you know, watch out for that. Oh, I'm so mad. It's very upsetting. Uh, so Lily explains that, oh, your husband and his friend came to my house. So I'm here now. Your family has hurt mine too many times. And she starts icing up. But then an arrow flies by and Paula is coming to the rescue. I won't miss on purpose again. Great line. And then she gives her one second to leave. And I'm like, I need a little more than one second, Paula. Yeah, she's like that's okay. real old. But Lily leaves. And Paula says, Barb, you need to learn how to use this. And then we go back to Mike and Jakeem still running through the woods until they get caught in a trap. And they're pulled up into the trees. Um, for those of you that were at Dragon Con, 
when um, Alcoye was at the panel describing being in very close quarters with Trey and just giggling a lot. This is the scene that he was talking about. Um, and I would like to point out that uh, Angelica was very good about like shutting that down <laughs> before he said too much. Oh, <laughs> she took a real leadership role in that. That's funny. But yeah, this is the scene Alcoya was talking about where they're trapped in the net, all stuck in together. From what I've heard about how the two of them are together, that day on set must have just been chaos of them just having so much fun. Lots of giggles, I'm sure. And they learn that it isn't the uh, albino gorilla that set that up. It is Cindy. And I was excited to see her back, even if it was only for a couple minutes. And uh, I, I like when Gio talks to them. What are you two idiots doing here? Thunderbolt's like, hey, we found her. There's something I've been dying to talk about in this scene. Okay. When Cindy poofs, mm -hmm. the Thunderbolt says, just like Batman. Yeah. Now I'm like, what? Because A, I want to point out that's not in my script. Oh, okay. So either Seth ad-libbed that scene and they decided to keep it. Or I, I imagine he's doing a lot of ad-libbing in the booth. I would think so. Um, or, you know, they thought it'd be funny to throw that in. Because, you know, before he said it, my thought was just like Batman. And then he just echoed my thought. Mm -hmm. But does this mean that there is an Earth 2 Batman? Yeah, I was between that and then I wasn't sure how much Thunderbolt broke the fourth wall. If he was like a Deadpool type character. He doesn't seem to have done so at any point so far. My only other thought was last episode when he's like, oh, a lot of horror movies have filmed at this set. Mm. If that was an intentional line. I think that was just saying like, this place feels like a place I've seen in a million horror movies. Yeah. Because I've said that about places. But him mentioning Batman, there are only two possibilities. There is an Earth 2 Batman. Or... Given the context that he knows that Batman does that, that it's a pop culture reference to Batman so that Batman is perhaps a fictional character in Earth 2 the way he is here, which I like less. Yeah, I like that less. I would rather there be a Batman. Actually, there could be an Earth 2 Batman and being a superhero slash superhero adjacent being, you know, perhaps he uh, knows Batman. Yeah. The Earth 2 Batman was in the JSA. Okay. And in fact, it was his diary after his death at the hands of the electrocutioner that uh, kicked off the entire America versus the Just Society of America uh, oh. story. Okay. So that's what I'm going to go with. There was an Earth 2 Batman, but like back in the ago, mm -hmm. he's dead now, killed yeah. probably by the electrocutioner. This is what I'm going with. All right. I'll run with that too. Uh, until I'm informed otherwise, Stargirl's world had a Batman. Boom. Oh, uh, one more thing to say about this scene before we moved on is uh, there is a line that got cut that I really loved mm -hmm. after Cindy vanishes. Mike says something like she's out of her mind. And Jakeem replies with, she's my lizard dream girl. I wish that was still in there. Me too. Yeah, I love that line. So I just wanted to throw that out there. This, These are the gems that are sometimes getting cut for whatever reason. That's so funny. Uh, I also wanted to bring up her line when she's explaining what she's doing. She's trying to, she thinks that the gorilla killed Gambler. So she's trying to catch him in order to clear her name. And then shove it into your sister's dumbass friend's faces. I love how she's not shoving it into Courtney's face. It is Courtney's friends. I thought that was, especially after the way she left and turned on Courtney, I thought that was a pretty big distinction that she made there. Yeah, I mean, she, she knew that Courtney was still on her side. She was just scared and embarrassed and angry. Yeah. Um, and lashing out. And, you know, now she's had time to think in the woods, apparently. <laughs> I'm not good at estimating, but I'd say like 30 feet tall. 
<laughs> it's definitely not good at estimating. No, not at all. So she Batman's away and they hear the gorilla make a noise again. And so they make a wish and end up in Richie's with their milkshakes. Something finally goes right for them and they're drinking their milkshakes, having a great time. And then the Thunderbolt's like, you know what I totally forgot about? The gorilla. Check, please. Yeah, that was great. It also seemed like the patrons were maybe um, somehow, uh, I don't know, like flashy thingied. Yeah. Because there was the bright light and they weren't like, what? Oh, my God. Where did these kids come from? They seem to be like, like, you know, that thing after the men in black flashy Mm -hmm. thing you and you're like, oh, okay." And your brain's just sort of piecing the fake narrative together. Uh, Then we go to Paula teaching Barb how to use the crossbow. Barb is saying, this isn't me. I don't do this. And Paula's like, yes, it is. You know, Courtney's your daughter. She's a fighter because of you. She gets it from you. At that point, I just wrote, I love this friendship. Yeah. Paula trains Barb. I love this friendship. And it's a shame that the training is not going to continue because Barbara's not very good. She fires an arrow and they can't even find it. You fired it, right? Yeah. And Paula's just like, oh, that's okay. I got lots more arrows at the car. Also, I like Paula's line, not all heroes fly around. Some shoot arrows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is maybe a green arrow reference. Mm-hmm. Because, hey, flash fact for you. There definitely is a green arrow in this world. Or, oh, yeah? Or was. Because we oh, okay. saw him. He was in the Seven Soldiers of Victory. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. If there can be a green arrow, there can be a Batman. Absolutely. And that's what I'm sticking with. Well, I also thought she might have been talking about herself. That she's now seeing herself as a superhero that shoots arrows. Yeah, I'm going with my thing. It can be both. It can be both. And then the scene that I was most terrified for was Courtney's walking and running into Cameron. He's sitting on a bench. I'm like, how do you even start this conversation? I mean, she tried to start it last episode. Right. But, you know, a little bit, a few things have happened since she tried to first talk about it. Yeah. Kool-Aid Man really, really blew her chance at this. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) That was more... Randy Savage, and the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> uh, Cameron saying that his grandparents aren't evil. They're angry and he's angry. Courtney tells him that, you know, I didn't want to change your memory of your dad, but he was not a nice guy. He killed people to get what he wanted. And, you know, I, to, to Cam's credit, he sort of is accepting of that. Yeah. He doesn't feel like Courtney is lying to him when he's told that his father murdered a bunch of people and was about to murder many many more Mm -hmm. he basically was like but did you have to kill him to stop him yeah which simultaneously acknowledges that he did have to be stopped if courtney's saying he had to be stopped then he had to be stopped yeah but maybe not that way no he he's like did you have to take him away from me which is heartbreaking even though you know who his dad is and what he's done And he just keeps demanding to know who it was who actually did it. And she's like, it was an accident. And he just keeps pushing it. And so instead of throwing Mike under the bus, she says that she did it herself. And his only reaction is to say that he doesn't ever want to see her again. Which, fair. And, you know, it's uh, so Courtney to sacrifice any hope of this relationship Mm -hmm. in order to make sure that Mike is safe. Absolutely. Because there's there's no coming back from from like I killed your dad. Yeah, I can't see you. A way that goes. A way that could go well. No. No. So uh that was a, a tough choice she made, but a very grown up choice. Then we go over and the Crocs are visiting Lily and Sophus, thinking that maybe we can get through to them because we were on Jordan's side. So maybe they'll listen to us. They come in, and again, the seating is switched that Lily and Sophus are on the, the love seat, and they're on the separated chairs on the other side. And they're just kind of like, we all want the same thing. We want a better future for our children. Yeah, they're really appealing to their love of Cameron. Mm-hmm. And the fact that through it all, Jordan was trying to help people, and Jordan wouldn't have wanted all of this endless murder. I mean... Despite the fact that that guy literally spent 
11 years traveling around the country just to murder people. Yeah, I think that guy was cool with the murder. But on the other hand, you know, he did try to spare even some of these people. Uh, he didn't want to kill Courtney because of his affection for Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, he tried to resist it. And uh, to the point where, where Brainwave was like, what? Yeah. Excuse the hell out of me. I killed my wife and son. I think you can kill the girl you have a crush on and their daughter. Yeah. He was not thrilled about that. No. But yeah, I, um, if we want to just skip ahead to finish out this sequence with these guys, they really like Sophus is on board. You know, Sophus is, is down. That dude just like wants to chill out already. No pun intended, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and Lily seems like she could very well be coming around. She might be ready to let go of this and f forgive. She never does give an answer, but I definitely get the same vibe from her. Yeah. Meanwhile, back at the pit stop, Pat's about to jump into Stripe to go see if he can spot Mike and Jakeem from the air. But they come in before he actually takes off. And there's big hugs all around. And then they tell him about the white mutant gorilla. That just made me realize something. Do you know who is not in this episode at all? Cosmo. Oh, you're right. There's literally no Cosmo in this whole episode. Yeah. I was trying to think. In 7 and 8, they were gone. But, or Cosmo wasn't there. But that's because Starman was off with him. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, in 7, we did get... Starman flying through the air on Cosmo. Right. Three straight Cosmo-less episodes? Yeah, that's weird. I'm astonished. Hopefully he's coming back with a vengeance, so. Yeah. Because my thought was, like, you want to look from the air, and you think Stripe is the, A, the, the best way to do that, and B, the most low-key? I think he's not really worried about that anymore. He's just too concerned about the sun. But if there are options... One is far more maneuverable. But Pat would have to have someone else take him. He wouldn't be able to take charge. Maybe, there's, himself. maybe there's sensors in, in Stripe that he can uh, utilize to look for people on the ground or something. Yeah, that would make sense. Anyway, him wanting to get in Stripe made me wonder about Cosmo. Yeah, I could see that. But anyway, they walk in right at that point and the VFX budget thanks them greatly. And uh, Mike and Jakeem tell him about the white mutant gorilla Pat and Sylvester share a look. They know that gorilla. I'd say it's one of the most dangerous things the JSA ever faced. Uh, a little later, they're back at the house and they're filling in everybody about the ultra humanite. Not everyone. Rick is not answering his phone, so he is not there. Oh, correct. He's probably just brooding. Oh, I also wanted to point out Cameron's face versus Rick's face. What about him? Cameron had a little bruise on his cheek and Rick looked like he went 15 rounds with Tyson. Yeah. And I mean like 1990 Tyson. Yeah. He was in rough shape. Yeah. Not that he would admit it, but yeah, that was uh, some subdural hematoma going on. Um, and I think it was Beth who said that Rick wasn't answering. So he could have just been dodging her calls. Yeah. Not wanting to get lectured anymore. But Pat says that the man that Mike and Jakeem found is the worst thing that they fought and they're like, no, no, we didn't find a man. We found a giant albino gorilla. And that's when they kind of tell the backstory about how he's to be a scientist and called the ultra humanite. And then I'm guessing it's straight from the comics, how he put his brain into an actress and won the Oscar and all that. I don't know how much of that is from the comics, but I think Dolores Winters is from the comics. Um, I think Dolores Winters was a one-time Ultra Humanite host. Okay. I don't know if that goes back to like the old comics from the 40s. Because, I mean, Ultra Humanite in the comics was initially a person. Just mm -hmm. like a dude. And he swapped his brain into the gorilla. It's not like they introduced him as a gorilla and then like made that story, you know, that, that he yeah. used to be. Like he started off in the comics as just like, a dude called the ultra humanite. Yeah. But I love the idea that he went and to escape the JSA 
put his brain into a famous actress and then went on to win that actress an Oscar. So that really shows how many layers that ultra humanite has that he is already you know, a smart scientist, smart enough to know how to swap brains and survive. Yeah, I want to know how he does that by himself. Well, he doesn't do it all by himself because Dragon King helped, right? He helped at some point, but not at all points, it sounds like. And they decided that Ultra Humanite likely is who killed the gambler. Sylvester's like, yeah, that's definitely who could have sucker punched me. Makes sense for the torn up trailer. Yeah. And then they said it would be his MO to be watching everyone on camera. So we know that wasn't him. Well, we do now. Yeah. Although it was kind of obvious it wasn't a gorilla before. Yeah. Gorillas don't like to do puzzles. Courtney thinks this is the best opportunity to, to bring everybody together to face this terrible threat. Yeah, it's a real evil that everyone has to join together to stop it. And she includes Lily and Sophus on her list. And Sylvester is not good with that. But like it's it's pure like peak Courtney here. Yeah. She's very serious about this and she's inspired. You can like see mm -hmm. her feeling inspired. And you're like, go, Courtney. This is this is the Courtney I signed up for. Yeah, we're getting like first episode energy of Courtney where she was so excited to bring in Cindy and teach her the ways of the good and all that. And uh, we haven't had much of that recently. So it was really good to have her back and then try to get through it without crying. I just saw in my notes what the next episode, what the next scene to talk about is. I'm having difficulties here. Yeah, I know. Because they're like so cute running under an awning to get out of the rain together. Yeah. They get a call from Artemis. And she got into Nebraska. Yeah, she's she's got a, a college football scholarship. Yeah, the first female quarterback. I think on a college team period. Is Nebraska like a big college football team? I'm not sure. I kind of was assuming that it was to keep her local so that the future seasons were to happen, that Artemis would be able to be around. I, I feel like other than Texas, Nebraska is probably the state that's the most into football. That could be. What I love is they are so excited with Artemis on the phone and then they hang up and then they turn to each other and they continue to be excited. So they weren't putting on a show for Artemis. Oh, they're super proud of her. So proud. And they're so proud of themselves for raising a daughter who did this. This is the reason they broke out of prison was to come watch her tryouts for this same guy. Yeah. Who just happened to be at practice today. Yeah. And everything. So they did play a little part on getting her time to play by taking out some of the coaches. But once they went straight, you know, this past whatever time, she did this all on her own. Oh, yeah. It's all Artemis. She's she's very go get them, as you can see from her attempts to join the JSA. Mm -hmm. You'll note she hasn't actually had a conversation with Courtney. No. The most she said to Courtney all season is go team. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that we get more Artemis. They're calling out everything is coming up crack today. Ugh. Then we have all these flyers for Rip City. Yeah, I mean, look, honestly, I don't know how you felt at this scene, but like I obviously I knew it was coming, but I still got that feeling like if I didn't know what was coming, I would know what was coming. I knew it was coming. So the, the icicle reveal was not as big for me because I was so upset about them. Well, I, I feel like they could have just been hurt until the reveal and then you're like oh no they're they're dead they're for they're for sure dead but also they should know you got a whole bunch of flyers from rip city leading to a manhole cover that can't be good they knew because he said like if someone's looking for trouble they're going to be sorry they found it yeah they just didn't reckon on their old supposedly dead boss being down there okay so i mm -hmm. want to talk to you about this they both get blasted. We don't really see what's going on yet. And then we see this figure in this mask. He reaches down, getting ready to pull off the mask. Who were you expecting? Oh, at that point, I was expecting Icicle. You were? Yes, because I did not think it was going to be Cameron. 
and it didn't look like the build of Lillian's Ophis. You really couldn't so I thought, you know, tell that it was ice so much yet, though. Maybe I was just too concerned about them. I mean, the point uh, is, I didn't care. I think the most you was. saw was um, <laughs> Croc did like a like an I've been stabbed thing, and some steam came out of his mouth. Yeah, so I I didn't care who the person was because I was just concerned for Croc and Paula. I mean, that's fair. Uh, I, I, we loved these characters back when they were murdering people, and now that they're not murdering people anymore, we love them even more. Yeah. Oh, and the way they reach out to each other. Oh, yeah. Say, I love you. Oh, my God. Yeah. There's a moment where you're like, I mean, maybe they can come back from this. And then Jordan's like, I know what you're thinking, audience. Nah. And and just atomizes them. Yeah, this was the uh, perfect happy episode to watch right after hearing that the show was canceled. Yeah. Really giving us the same feeling. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really upsetting that they're dead. It really is. And then I guess we are to assume that he was the one watching everyone and that he was also the killer. I mean, they were in the viewing room. Right. So I think that makes sense. But we've also been led astray. So I don't know if he actually was the one that killed the gambler. I mean, we could have a classic two villain situation going on. Yeah. You know, maybe they're right about the ultra humanite having killed the gambler. Yeah, I feel like he has to have a purpose in here somewhere. We have three more episodes to explore that. So we will yeah. see. And that's it. Man, it's a real bummer this. End on that. I can't even like bring it back. Yeah, I know. But fortunately, we have this uh, great interview coming up. Right after these magical ads. Stargirl After Show. Well, guys, as promised, I think I promised it. Um, we're here, uh, Sarah and I both this time with one of our favorites. It's Breck. Hi, Breck. Woo, hello. Thanks, Sean and Sarah, for having me back. Uh, Star fam, we love it. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. So excited to talk with you. Pleasure is all mine. So uh, we were just discussing with Breck how at the end of the season, after where everything's done, we're going to have like a little retrospective of the whole show and say our heartfelt goodbyes. But uh, first, Breck, I think that we do need to address the fact that this is uh, the, the home stretch. We're approaching the end of the show. And uh, I just want to get your thoughts on that real quick. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm already going to start crying. Um, you know what? It's so funny because, like, I, I just did a podcast recording, like, right, right before this. And they were talking and I was completely fine. And then but being here with you, being with people that are so involved with it and also they're having a different kind of heartache than, you know, um, I, mean, I get emotional. I have to say, with everything going on with the CW and Warner Brothers, I, I did unfortunately see it coming. So I do think I was a little bit prepared for the news, which I'm actually I'm so grateful for because I think had I just been completely um, taken off guard, I think it would have hurt even more. Um, I'm processing, but I do feel a lot of peace. I'm so grateful that Jeff like did shoot two endings because I want the same amount of clarity and closure and peace um, that I'm in the process of finding for everyone that has watched Stargirl from the beginning. I, I keep saying this. I think this is what I post on my Instagram and I keep going back to it. But even more than sadness, I just feel so much gratitude for like the friends and family that have become family that I'll have for the rest of my life. And Stargirl has been one of the best experiences. And I won't, I won't keep going because this can be part of the retrospect in a few weeks. But overall, I do. I have a lot of peace about it. I, I feel very similarly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, did you have anything particular that you would like to ask Breck? Uh, well, I first wanted to say thank you for being such a bright light and doing something that other superhero shows haven't done. Like, you're such a positive influence for... Uh, I always think of my niece. She watches the show and she loves you and looks up to you. So it, now I'm going to start crying. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know. I go, the tears are on the ball. We're on the ball. 
But I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you are an amazing influence. So shifting thank over. <laughs> um, there it goes. There they come. There they fall. Fine. Actually, Sean, if you have any questions, I can't think of anything right now <laughs> to jump right into. No, you know, I'm I'm just I'm I'm very emotionally wrought over the last week or so. It's it's been a lot. Um, Breck, uh, I I tweeted out that you had um, sent the crew a heartfelt little video. Um, I didn't post it or anything. Um, it was <laughs> it was just for us. But um, I I got a little notification from Star Girl season three uh, email, and I was like, "What is this?" And I click on it, and it's a it's a, a video from Breck. Uh, just the sweetest message, and I'm like at work and like misting up. I was like, I can not watch this again right now. <laughs> so I had to stop it. Um, but I, I really just wanted to say that like y- you very much impress me as a human being continually. And I think you're just an amazing young woman. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have gotten to know you. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate those words. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I like really admire you. You're like half my age, but I admire you. <laughs> um, no, you know what? It took me about five takes to record that message to the crew because every time I would, I started crying and I'm like, this is not, this is not, a, it, well, it's emotional. This is a positive. I wanted it to be a positive thing. But the last day of filming Star Girl, when I rapped, I didn't give a speech and it, it is eaten me alive it has kept me up at night but i think the thing that i felt then and i think i the thing i felt when recording that that message is i have such a hard time putting into words like what this show and what this experience what these people mean to me so like even when i wrapped on third season i was like i don't even know what to say because you this show this experience just continues to leave me speechless so i I did my best to like try to find words but still I, i will never be able to find words that capture like what everyone means to me well, speaking of speeches and moving on to happier topics, I need to talk about your acceptance speech for oh, no. oh your second gosh. Saturn Award. Okay. So I'm currently filming in Vancouver right now, and I try not to ask for things. Like, I try to be that actor that, like, really doesn't ask for things. But when I, I found out, not that I won, I actually found out that Jeff was getting an honorary producer award, and they had asked me to come present it to him. And that meant so much to me. So I asked this production, I was like, guys, you know, like I'm a trooper. I show up. I don't ask for things. I am asking, allow me to be at the Saturn Awards. Allow me to present this award to Jeff Johns. And they were so kind. They actually moved production filming a whole week just so I could go to the Saturn Awards. So there was all this like effort. So many people had changed so many things so I could be there. There was like 50 categories. I was like, okay, I I can go to the bathroom. Like I'm fine. I went to the bathroom once in the five hour award ceremony. I went to the bathroom once I am sitting on the toilet. This might be TMI, but it's the truth. My phone. Well, first of all, it's just Jeff, Jeff, Jeff just texts me. He goes, where are you? Question mark, exclamation point. And I don't really like think anything of it because Jeff and I are just like best buds. And I'm like, oh, you probably just didn't see me leave. And this is like wondering where I went. Then I get another text from him. Then I get a text from my friend Harvey from Into the Shadows. I'm like, oh, Harvey, like Harvey, our friends, but he, what is he doing texting me? And it's just a text from Harvey being like, whatever he said. And I like sprint out of the bathroom. I'm like trying to get my dress zipped up. Like as I walk onto stage, I'm literally still zipping up my dress. And I was so frazzled, but it's funny because I was actually quite nervous to like give an acceptance speech. And I think that was like such a divine moment of that happening because I didn't have time to be nervous. I didn't have time to like overthink what I was going to say. I kind of just like frazzly, that's a word. It's a word that to describe how I was speaking. I frazzly, um, frazzly, whatever. Um, yeah, that was funny. I le- And then afterwards, my dad was at home watching it live. And I just get like a text from my dad. He goes, live TV, live anything, Breck, not, not your thing. I'm like, thanks dad. <laughs> For anyone that didn't see it, uh, Oh, yeah. Rex win gets announced and they're waiting. And one of the people over in the wings actually says, like, is she in the bathroom? <laughs> and then Jeff comes up and stalls for as long as he can, gives up on stalling. The music swells and then Breck just rushes out. 
<laughs> from backstage. Mind you, like we're supposed to come up from the audience, like from our, our table. And I don't even ask. I'm in the bathroom backstage. I don't, I rush. Don't even talk to the stage producer. Don't, don't talk to anyone backstage. I just rush onto the stage. As far as I knew, like Harvey could have been BSing, texting me and they didn't even announce me. And I was just going to run up on the stage and be like, sorry, wrong, wrong entrance. Sorry. But, um, it or wasn't. security yeah, tackles you. Like, yeah, seriously. But I, at that point I was like, so narrow vision. Like I just have to get to stage to accept this freaking award that like production pushed a week for me to accept slash present, but still. <laughs> it, uh, it was the most entertaining thing that I've seen in, in a while, honestly. And yeah, look, I definitely became like the running joke of the night, like a presenter or an except someone who won an award got up there and was like, first and foremost, I just want to thank Breck Bassinger for giving me the confidence to go pee. And I was like, I love that. I will happily be, be the joke. It's, it's where I live. They don't give you any sort of schedule of like which things are being presented when no they have this like beautiful like thick um what i thought not like what would it be called like a not a schedule but like Like a a schedule with all the categories but they weren't following it they were going in like a random order so i was just like i mean what are the odds they do mine in the next the seven minutes that it takes me to go to the bathroom unzip my dress like and zip it back up no world no world where that happens but pretty good odds pretty good odds turns out yeah it was great and uh you know Kudos to Jeff for being so, uh, I know. so uh, quick thinking and jumping right know. And there. he was so funny. He had the crowd like rolling. So, like that just, just goes to show like Jeff and I were laughing about it the rest of the night. We're like, everyone goes up there and has like a vibe. Like when they give their acceptance speech, like you can kind of like see into them as a person. I'm like that, that's me and Jeff. Like that is our friendship. That is us. Yeah. I, I absolutely love all of that. Um, I haven't <laughs> been able to see, uh, jeff's award because i can't like i was looking for the whole thing somewhere online and i can't find it anywhere yeah fortunately someone like uh, my manager she recorded me presenting and jeff accepting but that's the only recording that i have is like from my manager's iphone 5 an iphone 5 <laughs> wow she needs a new iphone like she re- no you know what? i might be exaggerating it might be like an iphone 7 at this point but it still feels vintage yeah, that's very vi- very vintage <clears throat> I can't speak. It's very vintage. Yes. <laughs> so this season of star girl, we haven't um, talked to you yet at all. I'm used to having you on episode six, every episode, every yeah. season. Yeah. Um, but you're too busy being a huge, successful movie star. <laughs> so um, now, now we're going to talk about it. Talk to us a little bit about your take on Courtney's journey this season. I've personally been loving this season. I just love the whole tone of the season, but specifically when it comes to Courtney's story, it's been so fun to like see storylines through that were presented in first season. Like it took us three seasons to get here, but we're finally seeing these storylines through. Firstly, like the one I have to mention is like Joel, like Starman being back. It, Starman was such a big part of season one and he was only in like what one episode, two episodes. And then we knew he was back at season one, really didn't play much season two and finally get to like have him there to see that mentorship. It was so fun working with Joel. And then of course, gotta mention Camney, Courtney and Cameron, like the most slow burning love line in CW history, finally getting to to be front and center and getting to see Hunter, just like such a talented actor, finally get to be showcased. Like that's been so fulfilling for, for me, like not only as like his castmate, but as his friend as well. And the rest of like the, I guess we're coming up to episode 10 now and it just gets crazier and crazier. Yeah. 10, um, you know, we finally find out who the killer is. The person watching everybody is revealed and, um, you know, the, the Crocs meet their bitter end. And it's funny. I was talking to Jeff the other day and I was like, oh man, people are going to flip out at the end of the next episode. And Jeff, Jeff knows his audience. He said, oh, people are going to be mad. Yeah. But it's so funny because my, my aunt and my uncle, they were watching it and they're like, oh my gosh, they're really like focusing on the Crocs this year. Like, I feel like they just need like a spinoff. Like they're so funny, but like, it's so interesting how much, um, 
screen time they're giving them. And I'm like, oh yeah, because Jeff wanted to hurt that much worse. He wants you to fall even more in love with him, which we all have. Like, I absolutely do want them to have like, not like the traditional like superhero spinoff. I want them to have like a 30 minute sitcom of the Crocs. Like that's what I want for them. But it, I didn't know I could love them even more than I did the first two seasons. And uh, Jeff did that because he just wants every storyline to really hit you where it hurts in the best way. I mean, speaking of killing someone that you love, which I mean, Jeff kind of built a career on that. I want to talk about Joey Zarek for a minute because Will Dunster, our little Joey Zarek, is now the son of the Hulk. I didn't even know that. What? Oh, yeah. At, in the last episode of She-Hulk, uh, spoilers for the last episode of She-Hulk, uh, Hulk shows up with his son, a CGI Hulk creature, and it was Will. Shut up. That's amazing. I, I'm so baffled that you didn't know that. Yeah. I de- I'm so bad with social media, though, especially when I'm filming. I get so, like, laser focused on work that I, like, don't keep up with the rest of the world. Um, that's, I mean, I'm so happy for him. He was so talented, such a fun person to work with, even though it was, like, short-lived, way too short-lived. But um, that's, I'm so happy for him. Uh, yeah, you know, so he gets to move on to another superhero thing, and uh, yeah. he, he gets to be, I guess, completely CGI the whole time. Well, I'm going to have to go watch that just for him then. Yeah, it's just like in the last final moments of the episode, and if you watch it and you know that it's him, you can see him in, in his hulked out face, you know? How fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's exciting. I was I was like all hyped for it. Yeah, no, I'm. thank you for telling me so I can go find it. Um, well, that was sort of a dead end of a conversation. No, no, there's, it's a full circle here because we, that was like the, his death as well as, which is what, what made it, what it made me think of is that episode 10 of season one is when Henry dies as well, which was like the most gut wrenching episode. And then coming back season three, our episode 10, we lose like these Villains who aren't actually villains, like the villains with heart. Like episode 10 is just where everyone always gets killed. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, Jake's doing really well. He's got that Disney Plus uh, National Treasure show. I know. That just goes to show like what a wonderful cast we had. Obviously, they were wonderful people, but also like super talented. We see like Angelica, Yvette just booked another show. Like everyone is like, killing it. And I feel so lucky to have gotten to work with like so many wonderful people even joel joel just he's like eping starring in a new show a new fox show and he's here in um, vancouver filming it yeah you know i'm i'm waiting for joel to like finally make it big right 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 because yeah yeah, you know he's had such a humble career that no one would really ever recognize him or know who joel McHale is i think the reason it took so long to get him on as a series regular is it took those three years to like clear his schedule absolutely i think that man is literally booked three years in advance like But he, you know what, working with him this last season was so inspiring because even though he is so busy, he always showed up to work, like knowing his lines, prepared, in a good mood, even if he only got two hours of sleep that night. And it was like, he was just such an inspiring human being to work alongside. I mean, to be fair, I think two hours of sleep is like sleeping in for him. Yeah, him and Jeff both. I don't know how they function. (laughs) <laughs> Literally the first time I ever saw Joel McHale in person, he was asleep on stunt mats. Oh, that's yeah. Honestly, I have also done that. It's it's a pretty great place to nap. Yeah. Um, I keep meaning to like take the two photos and like post them together. Oh, really? Yeah. Can you? Uh, mine's from years ago. I don't, it would take me a minute to find my nap photo, but it's out there somewhere. I mean, as soon as you posted it, I saved it because I knew it went with the photo that I took of Joel sleeping. How funny. Can you please? Yeah. Can you share those with me? Yeah. Um, If you don't, I'm going to make the little edit. That's super fun. But uh, Ange and I were talking and she made a really good point that like one day, even though the show didn't like get the giant audience it deserves for whatever reason, she feels that people are going to discover it later on. And the cast is so amazing that you're all going to do such great things. It's going to be one of those things like freaks and geeks where Mm -hmm. people discover it years later and go, Oh my God, all these people came from this show. 
I sure hope so. I think that's a super optimistic attitude. And I, it's been so interesting because this past year was the first year um, because of the pandemic that I actually got to go to conventions and meet the thousands and thousands of people who love Stargirl. And it was so fulfilling because like, yeah, obviously there's people that watch the show, but it hasn't been like, like you said, I was like, I don't know. I love our show. So maybe I'm a little biased, but um, and I do feel like even like our Twitter presence has progressively gone up like this last year, almost every single episode we start like star girl starts trending. And I think it's been so cool because a lot of shows, it's almost the opposite where it's like the fan pace like slowly dwindles down and ours has is like just now building momentum and it, it almost it hurts even worse because now, you know, we're coming to a close, but I totally believe like that could happen. And like I said, it's optimistic, but I'm annoyingly optimistic. So I'll jump on board with that one. But I mean, all of you are like, doing great things you're all getting bigger shows and and great projects and i i have no doubt that one day someone will go back and be like i forgot all these people came from this yeah. one show yeah and look I as, hope so. That's cool. as someone who has been watching superhero tv shows for 33 years i have to say that um like Stargirl really is the apex of ongoing superhero TV shows, you know? And it's like all the Arrowverse sort of like Smallville first, but then the Arrowverse all sort of like laid the groundwork for Stargirl to be able to come in and just be an unabashedly like accurate comic book movie. That is what it is. And it's really, really fantastic. You no, know, I'm so proud to be a part of it. I do. I feel like Jeff unapologetically created the superhero show of the comic books that he grew up reading and writing. And it's been so cool to get to be a part of it and just get to learn so much more about like the DC universe. Like I said, I finally got to go to conventions. So I've gotten to meet like all ends of this, what I call like the geek community. And they're just like, the most wonderful people in the world. I fit in so, and because I'm star girl, they just get, they like, um, have accepted me with open arms. And I just like, I just love these people. Like I'm, I went to star fury back in May in Birmingham and I'm going back this upcoming year. And I'm like, so excited to go see these people. I befriended because I became friends with so many of them. And I just think it's really cool to get to be a part of this really wonderful community. Well, don't forget. Dragon Con missed you, and it is <sighs> it is Labor Day weekend. Sean, I shed tears over that. I so they actually fun fact. I'm just I'm spilling all the tea. They didn't send me an offer for Dragon Con, but I wanted to go so badly. I actually had my team reach out to Dragon Con and be like, "Hey, Breck wants to be there." And then we got it. Took like a couple of weeks. We finally got a deal worked out. I was going to get to go. And you know what? It just wasn't God's plan. I was, I'm, was supposed to be filming. And like I said, I really try to save my asks for when it's something like presenting a, an award to m my family, like Jeff. But I was gutted that I was not there. I was like FaceTiming Yvette. I had such FOMO. I think the thing I had the most FOMO about was like the, the panels with, um, with them because you know, those are my people. And that would have been so fun. I did go to all the panels, of course. And, you know, I've noticed that you just like Courtney is the, the leader of the JSA. You're sort of the leader of the cast. But I have to say, Angelica did a good job stepping up. I believe that she's so well spoken and so fun. Like, I can totally see that. You know, people were turning to her for like guidance. Alcoye, um, not a guest of the con, just showed up to hang out with Trey and shut up. That's hilarious. Yeah. And so they were like, do you want to be on the panel? So they just like stuck him up there on all the panels. And at one point he was, uh, he was talking about the, the net scene where him and Trey get caught up in the, in the net um, when they're going to find Cindy in the woods. Yeah. And, and uh, he was trying to talk around. He's like, there's a situation where we're in like real close proximity and, <sighs> And Ange is just down at the end of the table, like looking over, like just listening for, she's like, no, no, no. Okay. That's enough. That's so funny. Oh, I love that. I'll just like showed up. That's the most like 
Al and Trey thing, their friendship was the most beautiful thing to watch unfold. Like they are brothers for life. It is so beautiful. I spent a lot of time with them that weekend and it was like my favorite thing of the weekend was discovering how tight those two are. Yeah, it's really cool. It's so special. That's like, there was so many of those types of friendships and relationships on set that like, I truly believe will continue. You guys all seem just so very close and I hope you all get to work or not all, but you know, I hope to see you guys work with one another again. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's totally a world where that happens. Um, I just thought, cause I'm we're at episode 10. That's just what came out. Right. Is episode 10. If it's not, you'll have to cut this out. Episode 10, the one where Hunter and I like go to Hunter and he's like, who killed my dad? And I'm like, yep. me. I have a fun story. If we're talking about episode 10, I just thought of this. Cause I like, you know, I'm trying to be like relevant, you know, um, to what's going on right now. <sighs> that scene was one of the hardest scenes to shoot. So we were filming in Dallas, Georgia. It was outside, it was freezing cold because it's the middle of winter. And it's emotional. He was emotional. I was emotional. Like, like the scene is high emotions. Every single take, there would be an ambulance just going off or a, f- a fire truck going off or just like random people from Dallas, Georgia walking through our take. Like every single take. I literally don't think we got through the scene one whole time without having to stop for like something. And it was really frustrating because I was really excited about that scene and Hunter like I felt so bad for him there was this one time where like he had tears in his eyes like he was so present and they literally we had to stop because not only did an ambulance drive through in the middle of the take they parked in the background and we're like doing something in the background of the shot and we were just like we were trying to like say to him like Hunter just like keep looking at me in the eye like stay in the moment stay in the scene like don't pay attention to that and after about five minutes of Hunter and I just like emotionally connecting, we we're like, okay, we can't do this anymore. Like what's going on? Um, so that was, I'm sure I haven't seen it. I'm sure it turned out wonderfully because our editors are absolutely amazing. Um, but that scene was a crap show to get through. Wow. Anyway, that's my fun episode 10 story. <laughs> well, I can assure you that it did cut together beautifully. <laughs> I'm thinking what else happens in episode 10? Um, let's see. Paula is trying to teach Barbara how to shoot her crossbow and that goes super well. Um, I love that. I love Paula and Barbara's relationship. Their friendship cracks me up. Like, cause they're so polar opposites, but they're, when it comes down to it, they're both mothers. Like that's one of their, their biggest components. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just like, I think they're a dynamic duo. We didn't know we needed, but we needed. Yeah, this whole episode is really the fallout from the JSA attack on the McKent house. Oh, yeah. That fight scene, that was fun to watch. So in like a scene like that, how involved are you in the shooting of that? Is that like all stunt team? No, definitely not all stunt team. I would still say they do like a majority of it. It's interesting because it kind of depends character to character. So like for me, in our man... I guess not in that scene. So I actually was more involved than some, but like Hunter doesn't have a mask on. Our man has a mask on. So it's much easier to hide Mr. Ben, who's our man's stunt double under the suit than it is to hide Hunter's stunt double. So Hunter actually had to do quite a bit of his own stunts. And that was kind of his first big fight scene to be a part of. So it was really cool to get to see him just be like thrown in. Obviously star girl. I didn't have my, the cosmic staff in that scene. So I wasn't like quite in the middle of the fight fight. But um, as the seasons have gone on, I definitely feel like they trust us to do more and more and have allowed us to do more and more. Uh, So two questions Uh, while you were talking about that, were you struggling to keep Cameron and Cameron straight? Cause it seemed like did I I get their names confused. You did not, but you like paused a second before saying Hunter at one point. Yes. Cause then I also threw in like the stunt double name too. So we have Rick, Cameron, Cameron, Hunter, Ben. I'm like, but I'm, I see all those names. I'm only talking about three people. <laughs> um, and then the other one, I noticed that this is our third episode in a row without Cosmo. Interesting. He's not in the episode at all. So I think that's another like major part of this season with Courtney 
is she really does start finding a life outside of the star girl, which I think was healthy. She always like promoted finding balance between being a superhero and then your personal life, but she never actually did it. And I think this is the first season where she finally starts to do that, where whether it's with like Cameron, but also like just giving some of the the leadership up to Starman, which, um, you know, starts causing its own particular conflicts. But uh, yeah, I think that has a major part to do with it because she's kind of dealing with her love life more than her star girl life. Yeah. Uh, it might even be longer since we've had Courtney with the staff, but literally Cosmo is just not in these three episodes at all. Yeah. Which he's my favorite character. Like what's up with that? Uh, you know, I think he probably had a, <laughs> Like another show to shoot. He had like a guest spot yeah, on a movie. Yeah, he gets booked up a lot. He's very popular, very sought after. Okay, so here's the next thing I want to know about. Uh, the Black Adam premiere. Another, I just have so many like messes recently. Like I'm very chaotic right now because I'm just like so blessed, but I'm spread very thin with work. But because of that, I just get in chaotic situations. So, I didn't know there was chaos to do with this. I was just bringing it up because, you know, it's a... You got to go to a big time movie premiere with the JSA in a movie. Yeah, I was so excited. So my manager or like my team sent, sent the invite to me. They're like, oh, we know you're filming. You can't go. It's, it was, uh, I believe it was October 11th or 12th. It was October 12th. The premiere was. And I was like, no, I wrapped the night of October 11th in Vancouver. I can go to the premiere. I can be in New York by that next day. And they're like, okay cool i wrap 9 p.m at night in vancouver i go straight to the airport mind you i had a 4 30 a.m call that morning i go straight to the airport there's no direct flights that there's no red eyes basically at all and definitely no there's like two direct flights a day from vancouver to new york which doesn't make sense to me because they're both two major cities right. and you feel like there should be more direct flights but there's not so i had to fly to toronto then i landed in new york i had to go straight to a fitting because I was like, I need something to wear to freaking meet Dwayne, the rock Johnson. Absolutely. So I walked the 20 blocks to my fitting, do my fitting Yvette lands because I'm like, if someone's going to this black Adam, like JSA centered premiere with me has to be my girl in the JSA, Mrs. Yvette Monroe wildcat. So she lands at like four. We're supposed to be the red carpet at 630. We both start getting ready. But then there's like drama with the out, like with my outfit. So I'm like deciding, like, I don't know. It's freezing outside. And this outfit was like, shows a lot of skin. Like, I'm going to be very cold. Anyway, we call an Uber. Neither of us are good with New York, but we, we got a hotel that was close to the premiere. So maybe we can just walk. But we're both wearing these like giant heels. We're like, we are not walking and showing up with like our hair all blown. Because it's like kind of... It's not rainy, but like rain could come at any moment too. So we call an Uber. Uber takes us to the wrong place. Somehow we put in the wrong address. At this point, we're like supposed to be at the red carpet. I've been up for 52 hours straight at this point. Like I am not, I'm not all there, but I am there. Then we start walking, but we can't make it because we actually, the Uber driver took us further away from where the premiere was. We start walking. I'm like, Yvette, we're not going to make it. We're like, not going to make it at all. So we see one of the guys with the carts and the bicycle. And I'm like, Yvette, jump on. A, a We're pedicab. showing up to the premiere. What? A pedicab. A pedicab. I'm like, jump on the pedicab. So he takes us. At this point, somehow we're like 12 blocks away. We only started four blocks away. I don't know how we got this far away. So we're like pedicabbing through. Because New York is freaking gridlocked too. Like and it take, It's faster to walk than it is to drive but we don't want to walk in our heels so there's all these like suburbans pulling up like the black you know driver suburbans and we're just in our pedicab and i'm like calling the guy who's supposed to like walk us down the carpet i'm like hi i don't know where we're. and unfortunately we did miss the red carpet oh <laughs> i was pretty gutted about it because that was kind of like i'm not in the movie obviously like i wanted to go and support the film and support like another jsa movie but um that's kind of like you know i'm like oh i'm gonna go and get to walk this like giant red carpet like this was a really big thing for me like as an actor i was really excited to do it but we had we arrived right after mr Dwayne, and you know once mr Dwayne's there everything else is shut down except mr Dwayne, which i'm like i get that he's the rock <laughs> It was funny. I have a fun little story. During the movie, Yvette had to get up and go to the bathroom. 
And apparently the rock was just out there on his phone by himself. Cause you know, he like, I feel like he's another individual that probably doesn't sleep because he has a bajillion and five jobs right. at once. Um, and she just like went up to him and was like, I'm part of the JSA. He's like, how so? She's like, I'm Wildcat and I'm on the show Star Girl and I'm here with Star Girl and we're part of the JSA. And he's like, all right, okay. He's like, okay, bye. She like didn't ask for a picture, didn't do anything. She just had to <laughs> let him know that like we were on the same superhero team. And I'm like, Yvette, you are iconic and this is why we're best friends. That is perfectly Yvette. <laughs> yeah. It was it ended up being such a wonderful night. I think I total went with like by the time the next day I'd gone like sixty hours awake with an hour and a half of sleep. Don't suggest it. Wasn't the best. I have no evidence to back this up, but I feel like that's living that Joel McHale life right there. I agree. You know what? Joel McHale is getting me into some trouble because I saw him and I saw how he said yes to everything and he did it with such class. And I was like, oh, I can do that. I can. And that's the thing I did. The, I tried. I was going to come to Dragon Con. I was, but I was going to wrap at like midnight and there wasn't a red eye, but I had done it like, okay, well maybe if I fly out, but then I lose the three hours. And if I did it, I was going to have to have been up for almost four days straight. And I was like, Breck, I don't think you're Joel McHale. I don't think you can do this. You need to say, you just need to accept defeat here. But, um, I did try to live the Joel McHale life. I thoroughly tried. Just come next year. Yeah. Okay. We have to let you go, but I had a quick okay. question. Did you know, that Stargirl was supposed to be in the Black Adam movie originally. I did know that, actually, yeah. You sound like you know more about it than I do. Um, I just know it was right when I got cast in a Stargirl that they were starting production on that. And I think there was just some, not drama, like I feel like that's not the right word, but for lack of a better word, I think there was some drama in that like casting two Stargirls so close to each other. And I know Jeff, like obviously he's very involved with Stargirl, and I think he really just wanted like the show to have the focus and, you know, he's so lovely, but for me to just be the only star girl at the time, which is so beautiful, but I'm like, no, Jeff, you should have just let me go be in the movie too. But at that point we didn't really know each other. I don't even think we had started filming star girl. So who knows how I was like, who I was going to be, what I was going to be. Look, let's just throw it out there. Breck Bassinger for star girl in black Adam too. There you go. Let's start that campaign. Hashtag what Sean just said. <laughs> no offense to the two that came before, but I mean, this is the only star girl. Nobody, nobody. I, know, can I would top have been that. so, I know like the first draft was star girl in it and they had to rewrite it. And I'd be so curious to get my hands on that first draft just to see what it looked like. You know, I bet there's like an executive producer guy at uh, Warner brothers in DC that you might be able to like get your hands on that through. Yeah, just maybe I, if, if you think of someone, let me know. We'll do. Sarah, I'm going to give you last question if you have anything. Oh, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, we don't want to take up any more of your time, but I'm sure we'll have lots more questions when we do our season three show retrospect. Yeah. And I'm really excited because then the, literally the whole, whole entire forever show will be out there. So there will be no world for spoilers. So we can say whatever we want. Yeah. I, there are moments in the finale that I need to discuss with you, even if we just yes. talk on the phone. Even if it's like not on the show, I just need to discuss them with you anyways, because <laughs> I want to talk to someone about them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thanks once again for joining us for I don't know, fifth or sixth time on this show. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You've been on a lot and we love you for it. Thank you guys. This is always, I, y'all are just so wonderful and I appreciate you guys allowing me to come on here and share my chaotic stories. And this is not the last time we will talk. We will talk again. We do super love you and thank you for joining us. And we will talk to you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye. Girl after show. And we are back. I got to tell you, the CW is really, really eating into our podcasting. Really is. Not uh, too happy with them right now. Yeah. I mean... You're going to be like out of three shows before yeah. too long. Yep. Over the span of what, like four months? What are you even going to do? Oh, I got big dreams now. We'll see. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm already in talks to do another show on Hulu. So good. 
What show on Hulu? Uh, the Other Black Girl. Nice. Starring Ashley Murray, who is on Tom Swift. Sarah, you'll never believe this. I got called to be the graphic designer for The Other Black Girl. Did you really? Yeah, I know who, uh, like a few times. Um, I know the art department coordinator, so maybe I can help uh, hook you up with something over there. That'd be very cool. Because that is shooting here in Atlanta. Very cool. We um, we guessed it on a podcast, Ben and I did, uh, where we read The Other Black Girl and then reviewed it. And so then we saw that news, I think it was yesterday. Is it a book? It is a book, yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, oh, you know what? Speaking of books, I, I got to throw this out there. Um, I think that I've talked about Jeff Johns's new um, Image Comics universe, mm -hmm. uh, the Unnamed Universe. Yeah. Um, but he hasn't walked away from DC because he has so much DC stuff coming out. He's got the Justice Society coming back. But man, they got a a great shot of Jay Garrick where he's got like these old aviator goggles on. Oh, perfect. With his helmet and like it really works with his his outfit. That mm -hmm. looks great. Uh, Star Girl's coming back to the comics in her own title. Yeah. Just, just so much of our JSA Star Girl stuff in the comics. It's not continuing the continuity of our show. But when I talk to Jeff, I'm going to find out if there are any plans to do that. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Because I know season four had a general outline. I I even know what the basic story of season four was going to be. Oh, okay. So, guys, let's do a comic book miniseries. 100% on board with this. Yeah, let's do that. Um, it's a story that we need. Help us all out. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Jeff about that. Uh, maybe he's already considered it. Maybe he's going to be like, that's a brilliant idea. and I'm going to do it right now. That would be great. Sean McBee, thank you so much. By the way, Jeff and Breck and a couple of the other cast members have said just the sweetest things to me in the wake of the cancellation um, oh. that like make me feel so special. And even if they're, they're empty platitudes, I will take them to my grave as like some of the nicest stuff people have ever said to me. Because we've we've built a real star fam here. I really, really mean that. It's clear whenever we talk to anyone involved with the show how close everyone cast and crew was. And yeah, it's It's literally like the CW walked into my house and made my parents get divorced. Yeah. Like they're tearing families apart. CW is a home wrecker. I want to address something with the with the with the listeners here. Speaking of the CW. You guys and your hashtag renew star girl, it was great. People noticed. People appreciated that. And your passion has meant so much to everyone involved in the making of Star Girl. You have no idea. Our cancellation is not a reflection of your failure to act or a lack of love for the show. This is strictly a business decision, not even based on ratings, just based on the CW's desire to do different things. They want to focus more on making the cheapest content they can with the highest viewership, which means probably a lot of reality TV. Because um, as you may have read the CW has never been profitable. Yeah. And this company wants to make it profitable. And so there's no amount of letter writing or hashtags or fan interaction or ratings that could have made this outcome any different. The CW had their mind made up. So I want you all to be proud of what you did and just know that we faced a perfect storm of bad weather for this show because with HBO Max cutting their projects left and right, they're, they're literally throwing away $2 billion worth of produced content just as a tax write-off. 
So they're not looking to take on new shows that the CW doesn't want anymore. So that avenue is probably out. Um, I don't have any confirmation on any of that. I'm just saying like with the changes over at Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers having been sold, CW having been sold. If we had gotten another season, it would have been literally miraculous. So it's it's just bad timing from the start. COVID happened before our first season dropped that limited publicity and public appearances. We didn't go to sweeps week. We didn't go to get to go to conventions. None of that. The fact that we got a season two and a season three is because of you guys and how dedicated you've been. And the show has been like behind the eight ball the whole time, just with bad luck. But you guys and your passion have kept it alive for three seasons and we got to tell some really great stories and this is going to be the best season. You just, just wait. It's exciting and it's great. And, um, man, Breck really brings it home. So, uh, thank you all. And, uh, we, you know, we have more to say with three more episodes and then maybe Sarah and I will do one final farewell episode at the end. Yeah, I think so. Just a, a, a retrospective of the whole series. Yeah. I think it deserves that. I agree. Anyway, I've babbled on long enough. God knows nobody even listens to this end part of the show. <laughs> like, oh, the interview's over. Peace. That's why there aren't it's so many people buying all our awesome merch. That's true. Everyone should be going to stargirlaftershow.com slash shop yeah and uh finding all the awesome stuff there such good merch y'all and then obviously go catch sarah's other podcasts at fandomlim.com tom swift uh or uh, a swift review the tom swift review podcast and what's new nancy drew which is about nancy drew both in hiatus right now but we are gonna have a season four of nancy drew uh coming out mid-season we haven't gotten an exact release date but they are going to air all of season four and then that will be the end and yeah and then go to fandomlim.com and also check out table reads sean's other podcast and his other one <laughs> never gonna try to say it again <laughs> yeah they're they're podcasts there's also other great podcasts at fandom Limb. i recommend the wizard scroll if you're okay with um dirty language and blue jokes it's very funny and weird and raunchy anyway uh that's it for us we'll be back next week for episode 311 the haunting i believe i, I think know. i think it's called the haunting we'll see um i'm just going by memory at this point uh until then have a super great day Stargirl After Show is a production of Fandom Limb Media.